Tonight we're going to talk about fashionable science. We're going to explore topics such as recycling um, solutions, circular fashion, the creation of functional textiles for protection and performance. So our first speaker for this evening is Dr Leah Heiss. I have a really strong commitment to making wearable health technologies look better um, so that people want to use them and want to embrace them to go beyond that sort of medical aesthetic and, and look for other types of um, precedents. My research and practice is focused on designing wearable health technologies, experiences and services that aim to improve or save life. There's been this big sort of rift between the medical and the personal, and it's been a little bit embarrassing to say that you want to make medical devices look beautiful. Like, it's beauty. You're like, sorry, this is a hospital. We don't do beauty here. But I think that we can actually start to bring those things together a bit more and make sure that we've got, you know, technologies that people want to wear, but that also keep them well and healthy. So a lot of the work that I do looks like jewellery, but is also a drug delivery or a monitoring device. And this is intentional. So this is about saying, I have something and it, the agency has given back to me to declare whether or not it's a drug delivery or monitoring device. My most recent big project is FACET, which I designed for Blamey Saunders Hears. And so FACET is the world's first self-fit modular hearing aid. So it basically tries to do away with disposable batteries, which are incredibly challenging for people with arthritis or tactile insensitivity or vision impairment to change, or normal humans that have full tactile ability. <laughs> yeah. The bit on the left is the battery, the bit on the right is the smarts. They just click together, it's very easy. I come to this with a bit of a kind of craftsmanly way of thinking about it so that each material has its own properties and you engage with the properties of the material to see what it will do and particularly when you're thinking of the body as a site because things if they're just one or two millimeters too big or one or two grams too heavy then they become they become obvious and they become really uncomfortable. I spent a lot of time in the mineralogy collection at the Melbourne Museum because one of the central tenets of my practice is that in order to shift the stigma of medical technologies, you need to go wide and seek inspiration outside the frame. You just have to kind of keep working in this really sort of hands-on material way, you know, whether you're working with advanced fibres or, yeah, or additive manufacturing. And we 3D print in like titanium and stainless steel and all of these things, which all have very different types of material finishes. Please welcome Raj to tell us more about his nano-enhanced textiles. Nanotechnology in textile is actually not a new concept if you look at it. Nanomaterials impart interesting functionalities, but one of the properties that we wanted to incorporate into our textiles was photoactivity. We started developing materials which will actually use the visible and infrared region. Wound management. This is why we started the project. There is a statistic saying one in three people in the world get their legs amputated because of diabetes. And why? It's because you have wounds that do not heal. When you have a wound, the body sends electrical signals to your brain, and that's what triggers the brain to send the cells out there to heal the wound. But when that system doesn't work, it's going to lead to a chronic wound. So that piece of fabric that you see in the red color is the material. And what that material does is it absorbs infrared light and kills whatever bacteria that you throw at it. Bacteria are killed by something called reactive oxygen species. It's nothing else but um, small charges that will disrupt the, the cell wall of the bacteria. It, bacteria generally get resistance against metal ions or um, antibiotics and stuff like that but it's going to be really difficult for bacteria to generate or have a resistance to this because that's your normal body mechanism to fight a bacterial infection. So we're using the same thing but enhancing it 100 times, 1,000 times to kill the bacteria. What we now have is a simple technology which will not just kill bacteria but it will help in wound management. We have to exercise caution because unless we understand the material, understand everything, we should not be putting it out in the market or especially going for mass production. Our third speaker this evening is Dr. Nolene Byrne. Here's some shocking truths and some shocking facts about the textile industry. It happens to be the second biggest polluter worldwide. We're doing a lot um, around circular textiles down at the Institute. 
We take the textile waste and we typically turn it into a powder. So we shred it and we mill it. We can take that, that powder, it's essentially a coloured pigment, and we can screen print and we can make coloured textiles. We were essentially taking your old pair of denim jeans, we were powdering them and we were creating a new pair of jeans. So we've been learning a lot in the lab about what happens with the colour when we're trying to create and we're trying to recycle uh, these textile fibres because it's very important. But we're scientists and we want to do more fun things with, with, our, with our products. So we started to think, well, what, what value-added products could we create? And I had other students that were using wood pulp to make these aerogels um, and, and different um, bacterial cellulose and, and bigas, which is um, the waste from, from sugarcane, to make films that are cellulose. And I think we just sort of decided, well, why not try to see whether our waste textiles can, it's just cellulose, so let's make other products. So we started to look at aerogels. The aerogels that we get from the waste textiles, they have a slightly different property to what you get if you use other cellulose sources. So a colleague within, within the institute saw some of our morphologies, saw some of our SEM images, and said, oh, oh that, they look really interesting and would really suit a cartilage. So we've just started to do some, some friction measurements and yes, indeed, they perform very well as a cartilage. We envision having this sort of demonstrator where we work with collectors. There has to be technology developed around how we sort that. So we have to sort that by a fibre type. So at the moment, we don't really know what our clothing is. Is it a poly cotton? Is it 100% cotton? If the tag is gone, we don't know. So our final speaker for this evening is uh, Dr. Lyndon Arnold. Fashion is only skin deep. Crazes go right to the bone. I'd like to pay a tribute to a friend, Matthew Thompson, because he walked into us one day and he said, I fell off my bike and I got horrendous industry injuries. Can you do something about the cycling gear? The initial criteria were we want cycling gear that works exactly the same as the stuff that's already available. So it's got to be dyeable. It's got to be pretty colours. It's got to have logos on it. That was more important than the safety. Uh, it had to be slinky. It had to be aerodynamic. It had to be fashionable. Uh, and Matthew Thompson's thought was, but it also has to be abrasion resistant. And that's what wasn't in the existing garments that were on sale. Appearance and performance are everything. Fashion, fashion, fashion. But what happens when you crash? The international rules, unless the rules have been changed, if you notice, cyclists in international competition, their gear doesn't go below the elbow and it doesn't go below the knee. When we measured some of these common fabrics, we were getting a failure at 0.1 of a second. You hit the ground, it's gone. And yet what hits the road first, apart from the shoulders, is elbows and knees. We came up with some fabrics, a suite of fabrics, which were 100 times better than what was on the market. And in some cases, a thousand times better. Well, every thing that you want solved will require a unique solution, which may not be the best for what you want. It's got to be a compromise between all the requirements. Has it got enough stretch? Has it got enough strength? Has it got enough diability? Um, all of those things come into a final decision as to what is the best.